Hi, here we are now looking at ooh, children, yes or no. Now in sociology, of course, within the family, when we did the marriage as being one of the beginning points of family is having children, but not every family has a child. And some of that is undesirable and not choice, and some is choice, and so is the number of children. So having children is somewhat of a marker in our society, uh, you know, from a social, from a, a symbolic interactionalist, if you recall, that's the micro, and it's about how we interpret meanings of different things. So when someone has a, a baby, they have a little, they have showers, um, you know, men maybe exchange cigars or something like that. These are all sort of symbols that represent the importance of having children. And in the past, couples had relatively limited choice. Either they had a child or they didn't because they could or they couldn't or because the medical circumstances and the conditions in which children were being raised were more difficult. The rates of child deaths were much higher back in past years. With legal and easy contraception, and there's a lot of different variable um, uh, techniques, the availability of abortion, uh, parental uh, prenatal diagnosis, amniocentesis, technology assisted conception. There's many, many more options for which families can have children. They're not all inexpensive. Some of them are very expensive. And so this is what we're going to look at in this particular chapter. Not only to have children or not, but in what manner or how to have children if we can't. All right. So good luck with this chapter. I hope you enjoy it and let's get moving right along. Okay, well, when you're looking at this chart here, what you're basically seeing is the fertility intentions of females between 20 and 39 years of age in 2006. So there's various reasons, both personal and social, for having children. Having a child results in a change in status and it's in a marker of an event. But over the past 50 years, there's been a significant drop in Canadian fertility rates. In 1959, um, you will see that the rate of, of, of fertility was 3.93 children per woman. By the year 2000, 1.49 children per woman. And in 2009, it jumped subtly up to 1.7 children per woman. At some point in their lives, nearly all Canadians will consider having children, and you can see by this table that shows only 7% of Canadian women don't intend to have a child. So 93% of Canadian families intend to have a child. It's something that people, all of us, seem to want to be able to do and to have. Now, when we think about this, there is what's called um, a social script. And we've touched on it in previous videos. This is, uh, there is still a great deal of social pressure for women to have children. It follows this thing we call a social script. But in a woman's experience, there is a myth of motherhood. The myth of motherhood says that motherhood is an instinct that can fulfill a woman in a way that no other experience can. Now that's not to say that it's not a critically and an important uh, uh, event and experience but to suggest that a woman will get no other greater pleasure in life than having a child is to, is to put limits on what some women want from their lives. Another part of the myth is the importance of having a child of each sex. Uh, without all four, the family is felt to be incomplete. You know, having a mom, a dad, and a boy, and a girl, or a son and a daughter is preferred and most desirable. For some unmarried women who choose to have children without a long-term partner, um, is this fulfilling the myth of motherhood? And it's considered the myth of motherhood because if you look at it, if, if you can see this in a lot of women's magazines, Women's World and, and, and such, if you look through every article or so many of, so much of the articles represent, you know, here's how you beat stress, here's how you raise a family, here's how you make that special meal, here's how you make that big party for your children, Here's how you lose 20 pounds in a week. Here's how you, here's how you, here's how you. The idea is that you're supposed to be a superwoman in order to be satisfactory as a wife. And that's just not true. That's not too high of an expectation. So the myth of motherhood was probably more of an expectation that, you know, your grandparents experienced and perhaps your parents. 
Now, when we think about um, the sociological perspective about having babies, what I've done here is just made a list of some of the theorists that are in your textbook, and I'm just going to highlight them. But what I've got is the images of the sunglasses just to remind you that each of these look at families, and in this case, having children, in a slightly different way. They see the same families with the same number of children, but they view them in a different light as to why that's a cat. What, what is it about why people have children and what's the value of children to Canadian society? So we'll start with structural functionalists whose focus on having children is a necessary function of families in perpetuating society. So from their perspective, when families produce 1.7 children per family and it's required in order to maintain and, sub, and, and sort of as people die off and we produce children the rate of replacement is 2.48 it means that we're not producing enough children to replace those members of our society that are dying so from a structural functionalist perspective is many families wouldn't be performing the main function of what a family is to do is to perpetuate the population now that's an older conventional um, theory, uh, but it is only one out of a collection. The developmental approach sees children, sees having children as a developmental task of most families that once you get married, at some point after you being married, you'll start having children. And it might vary as to how many children you have, but it's a part of the developmental stages that families experience. Conflict theories suggest that the social pressure to have children reflects a prevailing ideology of how families with children have greater social advantages than those without. And the social advantages would be, you know, that for example, and again, this is falling back on some history, that a, a husband who was uh, working would have a greater position and status and be seen by the employer in a more positive light if he was a married man with children that you would be in a better social position. You were seen as more stable. Now, you remember from conflict theorists that it's the uh, bourgeois that sets some of the criteria for which um, the proletariat live their lives. And so, um, from conflict theorists, it would be, so what is it about what the bourgeois think that's important that um, it keeps people in their place to have more children and keeps them uh, struggling in some cases? Now, systems theory looks at how decisions to have children create different subsystems that affect the family dynamic. So by having kids, you create subsystems, theoretically, and it's not so, so much that a child is a subsystem, but the subsystems about what groups that they're a part of, how do they interact with one another, and how does the family system interact as a group. The ecological approach looks at how the wider social content influences the decisions to have children. It also determines experiences of families with children. So in terms of the neighborhoods that you live in, how do the neighborhoods and the social groupings that you associate with influence whether or not you have children, when you have children, and if you have children, how many of those children do you have? Symbolic interactionalists focus on the personal reasons for having or not having children. It would be the relationship uh, for each individual family and how they make that decision for themselves. Maybe two people get together who have had experiences in childhood that they weren't happy with, so maybe they choose not to have children. They have a career that's taking a predominant and a higher priority than having children. And then the feminist theories tend to study childbearing as an issue reflecting women's control over reproduction and um, they take, a, they take a similar approach to um, children in, in so far as looking at the egalitarian where it's not so much um, what a man says that a woman should have a baby, but she has control over her own body for reproduction purposes. Jumping into um, the total fertility rate in Canada, this is ranging from 1926 to 2010, and this is going to reference what I mentioned earlier, that although the pressures on couples to have children is almost as strong as ever, the size of the Canadian family has been shrinking. In order to replace the population, each woman must have 2.1 children. Canada has fallen below this level since 1977. The total fertility rate that's the average number of births per woman 
over the course of their reproductive lives. And in Canada, it has been stable since 1996 at 1.6. So we haven't been producing, if you will, th um, the number of children per, um, per childbearing woman that's necessary to replace the population. Now there's reasons for that. There are explanations for that. And it's not it's like we're going, uh-oh, someone's not doing their part. So if you look at crude birth rate, this is a sociological term looking at population. It's a number of births per population. And it's been dropping since the Great Depression. The baby boom from 1946 to 1964 saw a dramatic increase from one generation to the next, a decrease in inf of fertility at the youngest ages and an increase among the older women. Postponing births into their 30s does not make up for the drop in fertility in their 20s. By postponing having children later, it automatically means you're going to have fewer children. Um, usually you're delaying it because of economic reasons and maybe career. And having children at 30, 35 doesn't mean you're going to have five or six children. It likely means you're going to have one or two, maybe three. A number of approaches to increasing birth rate to replace levels have been tried or suggested. Family allowance programs in Canada began in 1945 that gave benefits to children under the age of 16. Theorists suggest that an increase in fertility depended on providing conditions to increase people's confidence in their future. Encouraging immigration of young people who are of childbearing age will stimulate a sagging birth rate as well. Teenage pregnancy is generally seen as a social problem requiring preventative effort, um, efforts. The changes in teen pregnancy rate ref, um, reflect more effective contraceptive use, greater access to reproductive health, um, health services, and high quality sexual health education, a shift towards social norms. Um, teen pregnancy rates in Canada have declined each consecutive year since 1996 to 2006. In 96, 44.2% out of every 1,000 women ages 15 to 19. In 2006, that number dropped from 44.2% to 27.9% of teens who became pregnant or chose, um, uh, chose abortion. Uh, Canadian teen birth rate decreased from 22.1 per 1,000 in 96 to 13.7 in 2006. So why is the family shrinking? There's a number of reasons. Medical advances is one. The death of a child under the age of one, infant mortality, is, is down steadily in, in Canada since 1960s. This has been due to the improvement of medicines, medical support technology. You don't need large families to ensure the survival of two or three. Uh, part of the reason why there were bigger families was the risk of losing children due to um, illnesses or death in childhood. And so you produced a lot to sort of make sure you had enough to help with the, um, you know, the farm and, and work. But now the likelihood of, six, of, of survivability of children is very, very good. And so the family size has shrunk in part because of that. Contraception improved and more reliable. We had the pill in 1961, tubal ligation, vas vasectomies, all sorts of medical alternatives that people could choose to avoid having a baby. There were changes in law. Until July 1st, 1969, contraception was illegal. The birth rate showed its sharpest drop following legalization of birth control, and abortion was legalized in 1969. Economic trends. A shift from resource-based economy to manufacturing-based one has impacted the Canadian birth rate. Canadian labor, more children, um, was better and it was cheaper labor. Technology uh, and manufacturing advances, children were seen as a liability with that development of technology and manufacturing. With the depression came smaller families. Then there was an economic boom post World War II and we had some larger families and the baby boomers. In the 70s and the 80s more women were in the workforce and we had smaller families. Children are expensive. Raising a child to the age 18 costs nearly 167,000 in 2004. You can um, bounce that up to over 250,000 in this year. Um, psychosocial uh, reasons, the value of a child. Um, uh, the framework is classification scheme that includes three uh, satisfactions or values of children. There's instrumental assistance where they help the old age. 
There's a rewarding interactions, which is about companionship and love and psychological appreciation. And this is where parents live through their children. There's also the financial costs, um, the cost of education, the cost of putting children through school, the cost of the community supports that children want to be a part of, child rearing demands, emotional strains and pregnancy, restrictions on parents, being tied down, costs of social relationships, marital strain. There's a lot of reasons why families have been shrinking. It's certainly not all on the backs of women. When we see um, children, child-free by choice, I mean, despite the social pressure of having children, seven to eight percent of the Canadian population choose to remain childless. And there's many reasons for this. Some women fear having to give up their equality when they establish in a marriage relationship if they were to have children who uh, require their care. Some women don't wish to sacrifice a career to which they are dedicated. Some couples want to keep their options open for new experiences of all sorts, you know, travels, hobbies, adventures, education. And some do not have a partner with whom they want to have a children, uh, children with. Despite the growing acceptance of family differences, those choosing not to have children face disadvantages. Outsiders may become intrusive, wanting to know why someone remains childless. childless. Uh, women who choose not to have children are often considered antisocial or psychologically defective. You know, really? Couples, um, couples' marriages may be considered unsatisfying and they may be perceived as being selfish. Now, I have to emphasize on those last couple of points that that would be a social pressure and a social um, perception. It doesn't mean that women who choose not to have children are antisocial or are psychologically defective or that they are considered unsatisfying and perceived as being selfish. That's a perception. It's not necessarily the reality. There are many reasons people choose not to have children and they are legitimate for them. It's an important distinction to be able to accept and to make. Okay, there we go. There's the first part of children, yes or no. Carry on.